When I was a child, I was a total bookworm, and I could often be found reading books late at night with a flashlight under the covers or near nightlight. I wanted to read all the time. Everything. And I wanted to learn everything about everything. I was insatiably curious. It didn't really matter what it was, could have been history, could have been science, whatever, just that there was something new to be discovered in books. And I used light to do that, to read things in books. And if you were to step back and think about it for a moment, it turns out we use light for a lot of things in our lives. So we could look for the stray socks under our bed or read, as I did, or really anything else that we use light bulbs and LEDs for. Or we could control the TV with the infrared signals from our remotes. We can listen to the radio. We can use our cell phones and we can use Wi-Fi. We can go get a tan, microwave our food, get x-rays at the doctor's office, navigate with a GPS. The list goes on and on. We can use light for so many things, and that makes light very versatile. And it turns out that researchers can use light for a lot of different things as well. And there's a lot of different bits of lab equipment, so it could be anything from lasers and microscopes and spectrophotometers, the list goes on, to... And we use light from different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum in order to answer different kinds of research questions. And sometimes the things that we want to study as researchers are really, really big and really, really far away. So we'll send telescopes to space, like Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope, and floating out there in space, they'll go and collect data and we'll learn a little bit more about the universe. Sometimes the things that we want to look at are really, really small and much easier to contain, unlike an entire chunk of the universe, and we'll go to a research facility, like something, a synchrotron light source. And we're actually really fortunate to have one here on campus called the Canadian Light Source here at the University of Saskatchewan. As a kid, I was really lucky to grow up with Canadian Light Source, and this is my dad's fault, really. Um, he's a physicist by training, and after he married my mom in Germany and moved to Canada, he got a job at a place called the Saskatchewan Accelerator Labor Laboratory, or also known as SAL, and this is the precursor to the CLS. And at some point in the late, or early 90s, sorry, um, I popped into existence as a, some, what we call a SAL kid. And as I grew up, there were big discussions about building a synchrotron light source somewhere in Canada. And this could be in Saskatchewan, in Western, Western Ontario. Ultimately, SAL won out. And so in 1999, construction started with a new addition to SAL. And this would be later known as the Canadian light source. So imagine me about seven or eight years old. I know my dad works at a really cool facility, and now it's going to be even bigger and even cooler. Great. <laughs> and I got to grow up watching this thing be built from the ground up. It was super cool. You start with the entire shell of the building, and then you see these concrete tunnels being built everywhere, and you see these large magnets going in and all these pipes and all this other equipment. It was really cool to see from beginning to end how it developed. And I got to see this every single stage of this being built. My, my parents would take me in and my dad would show off all the latest developments as we went through and here's this new thing and this is what it does. So on our occasional impromptu tours around the facility, he'd explain to me how things work. So that the CLS uses light in order to answer research questions that researchers can come in and do research. And he showed me the electron gun and the linear accelerator in the basement of cell. And he told me about how electrons would get accelerated to nearly the speed of light. And he'd show me where the linear accelerator would connect up to the rings in the new facility. And he'd explain that the linear accelerator would send these electrons up into these things called the booster ring and the storage ring. And by using these really large magnets, these electrons would be sent around in these circles. And later on, he showed me these things called beam lines. And these electrons that were generating light by going around the circle, that light would go down this beam line. And that could be manipulated and filtered so that researchers could do different things with that light to answer their research questions. And each of these beam lines, there's multiple of them, they could all do something different. So you could have all these beam lines going at the same time. You could have multiple research projects going at the same time. And my dad would teach me other stuff as well. It wasn't just synchrotron related things. So he'd, he'd tell me about, for example, how a laser beam goes, through, like how it diffracts as you shine it through a pinhole in aluminum foil and you get this really cool pattern on the wall. And one summer he taught me about the optical properties of cameras and their lenses. 
we, we are a photography family. And another summer, he told he taught me all about Boolean algebra. Not strictly a science thing, but you can sort of see there's a theme going on here. And even when he wasn't teaching me stuff directly, we'd be going to museums and we'd be going to science and art galleries and everything. So there was always something to learn. It's always something different. So I'm sure you're all surprised to find out that I'm a science geek. <laughs> um, yeah, I knew as a kid that I wanted to do something sciencey when I grew up. And that changed over time. What that answer would be would be like, maybe a marine biologist, maybe a paleontologist, maybe an ecologist, maybe a veterinarian. It, it was everywhere, but it had to be something science. And eventually I settled on chemistry, and this was thanks to a great AP chem teacher that I had in high school. And it turns out he actually inspired a few of us to go into chemistry or chemistry adjacent fields. And even if it wasn't chemistry, a lot of us went into science or engineering, anything in STEM. And one of the things that was interesting about taking his course was that we had a textbook called Chemistry, the Central Science. Not chemistry, the best science, or chemistry, the most fun science, but chemistry, the central science. And inside the cover, it explained that all the sciences were connected to each other, with chemistry being one of the bridging ones. So it wasn't just physics off on its own over here and biology over there and chemistry or something else all unrelated to each other. They were all connected, and chemistry was one of the ones that really pulled them all together. And there were two things that I really learned from this. A, the sciences were connected. And B, that if I went to university, I'd be able to learn more than just chemistry. And I could actually explore some, a little bit more of all the other sciences in my career. And from there, maybe I'd be able to hop into a job at the CLS, hopefully. So I went to university with the intent of becoming a chemist. And one of the first people that I met there was a student in one of my labs in chemistry. And he told me that he's working on a degree in paleobiology, which sounded really cool. And it turns out that that degree is... Uh, put together by three different departments on campus. So one of them being anthropology and archaeology, one of them being biology, the other one being geological sciences. Three seemingly unconnected or disconnected departments from each other, but they came together, collaborated to put together this degree. And I thought that was really cool, that there was all this connection. And between that and the chemistry textbook, I really got inspired to pick up a second degree. <laughs> Also, I'm sure a big surprise. So I looked at all these different degrees that I could take, and I knew chemistry was still going to be my number one. And at some point, I got told, maybe you should just focus on the one degree for now and then think about the second one. I held on to that for about two years, ended up sliding to geology. And in the meantime, I also explored all these other interesting courses and electives across all these different disciplines. And I learned a lot about the courses themselves and the disciplines, but also about the toolkits that they use. How do they conduct research and how do they get the, how do they get the answers to their questions? And so I saw a lot of connections in between those disciplines. And then I held that information in my head as I thought about how could I use this potentially in my future as a future beamline scientist. And so my first taste of synchrotron related research was after my second year of university during the summer. I worked as a summer student in a biochemistry group that focused on protein crystallography. So, okay, what's protein crystallography? My summer in a nutshell, you get a protein, you isolate it, you purify it, you make tiny little crystals of it, you bring that to the diffraction beamline of the CLS, you get some sort of weird speckle pattern, you, you inject that speckle pattern into software, and then you get a 3D structure of a protein. That's really cool. I didn't know you could do that, but I'd learned a lot that summer. And actually, it turns out I did two summers of that. I couldn't get enough. And so that was where I first realized all the things you could do with a, with a Canadian light source or a synchrotron light source in general. And also just, I wanted to do synchrotron-related research. And another synchrotron-related opportunity popped up a few years later. In the geological sciences, I discovered a synchrotron-specific techniques course taught by two professors. And I registered as soon as I could, and I really dug deep into that course and learned as much as I could. And there were a lot of things to learn, such as the synchrotron techniques that they used, as well as um, lots of things that you could do with those techniques, what sort of research you could conduct. And so my supervisors told us about how they were using those techniques to look at mercury in fish, or to look at selenium in plants. 
And um, there was one example of a case study of arsenic poisoning in Bangladesh, where they examined how the water in the wells that they were using for the drinking water was contaminated with arsenic. And that was causing de uh, selenium deficiency in their bodies. And so by examining how this affected their bodies, they could look at how to treat it. And so obviously this would drastically affect people's health and their well-being overall. And it showed me how impactful synchrotron-related research could be to people's lives. And so I finished that course with a high mark, and I got an offer to join the research group. Heck yes. So I did, and keeping my chemistry and geology background in mind, I chose a project that focused on identifying different sulfur compounds in petroleum crudes with the um, decision to try and find out more about sulfur corrosion. And sulfur corrosion is a problem that affects oil refineries around the world, sometimes causing billions of dollars in damage to the environment, to near, nearby population centers, as well as to the refineries themselves. And this is a universal problem that is also decades old. And our research group's ability to use specific synchrotron techniques meant that our collaborators had access to a new set of tools and experienced hands. And that meant that they and we could work together to try and solve this problem. Still a work in progress, still a PhD student. Uh, <laughs> But I'm hoping that the work I do will also leave a lasting impact the same way that my supervisor's work has for their work you know, on the world. And meanwhile, because I didn't have enough to do, I also became a student employee at the CLS. And I worked there for a few years as part of the HSC department. And I also worked there as a tour guide. And as, the, as part of the HSC role, I learned a lot about the inner workings of the facility just the number of people that it took to keep it, keep it up and running and just the wide range of backgrounds that, that required. And I also learned a lot about the research done there through my role as a tour guide. And yeah, the CLS needs a lot of people. There's 250 people staffed there roughly, and it takes everyone from HR and finance and science and engineering. You need people from everywhere. And that facility supports over 5,000 researchers around the world and allows them to conduct their research there and to answer their questions. And by coming together at the CLS, there's the opportunity to collaborate and to conduct that cutting edge research that answers the, the critical questions that we have to deal with today. And we use light to do that. And again, the light is very versatile. There's 22 beam lines at the CLS which means that we can answer a lot of questions at the same time and just do a lot. There's so many techniques that we can use. And upon reflection, it's that versatility that's incredibly important, not just for the light that we use, but also for us as researchers. For me, by specializing in two different disciplines and taking an interest in learning about many others, I've also made myself more versatile. For one, I can communicate better. I can collaborate with others that are outside of my discipline. And I have more exposure to the tools that these other researchers use to answer their own questions. And I can see if there's a way to apply that to my own research, which means that I can look at my problems, my research problems in, from multiple angles. And it's this sort of versatility that will help us as a research community to tackle the bigger problems that we're facing today, such as climate change or food and water insecurity or worldwide health threats. Lucky for us, we have access to synchrotron light to help us address those sorts of big issues. The light is as versatile as the researchers who wield it. So let's get to work. Thank you.